Tom here from Lauren Systems and Unified Network Application 7.4.156 was released. I loaded it on May 17th. We have quite a few clients on here. It's a multi-tenant server that we have. Today is June 4th of 2023 and none of those sites have any issues. Any of the issues I'll be talking about aren't bugs, they're features because Ubiquity decided to change the way they do a few things and that's going to be some of the stuff I'm going to talk about here. They did add or adds the wrong word, bring back the feature to move a adopted device to a different site. They call it add because they added it to the new interface, but reality is we had that in the old interface and the old interface with each subsequent upgrade, including this one becomes less functional as they don't really want you using that one. But I had to use it for things like moving things to one of the different sites. If we had adopt something at my office and move it to a client site, well, we had to use it. They finally put it in the new UI. The OpenVPN server, we'll talk about that being good and weird the way they implemented it. So we'll get to that in a moment. And then we're going to talk about how they made VLANs more confusing. And this is an aggravation to me because one of the big selling points of Ubiquity of the Unify platform is being able to say, hey, this is how the VLANs work. And they've worked for a long time in a way that is slightly different, and but I think easier than the way you would maybe label a trunk port in Cisco. VLANs are one of those things that people always struggle with. And I was just always happy that Unify made it easy. And now they decided to do something weird and are going to make it more confusing. So I'll have to probably do an updated, dedicated video on how to do VLANs on the new after 7.4 version of Unify. It's not really going to change anything in terms of if you're already set up and you just move from a previous version to the 7.4. But the way you do a new VLAN going forward, my old videos or any of the old documentation uh, is not going to match. And I don't know why they did this because they had it so simple. So let's dive into a closer look at the the changes they made here. Now I'll be leaving a link to the full release notes here and we're going to talk more hands-on about OpenVPN and the port profile changes but there's one little thing that I don't think should be overlooked because this will save people a lot of time and it's reserving the fallback IP address of 192.168.1.20 DCP lease which is used when the unified devices fallback address and this is something that where if you have a device that's having trouble reaching the network that it's supposed to be on the dhcp server usually is just not available or whatever the problem may be it will default to a ip address of 192.168.1.20 but if something already grabbed that address, now you have an IP conflict when you maybe get this thing back online or the network's reconnected together. I think this is just going to be a big troubleshooting time saver for people. And it seems minor, but I think this is probably something that people will probably run into more often uh, than you may realize. Now let's jump over to our unified dream machine here. We're going to go over to the settings. We're going to go to teleport and VPN. And I have the WireGuard VPN server set up. Actually, I set up two different WireGuard VPN servers. Let's go create a third if we want, or we can go here and say, let's create an open VPN server. So we'll call this test open VPN. So we finally have open VPN server. Uh, it doesn't have a default port, so we have to choose this. So this is kind of cool. I don't have to leave it at default. It'll create the rule automatically in the system. I can then, if I want, let it pick the network or I can auto generate choose or type in the network I may want for the intermediary network that OpenVPN will connect the devices to. Then we have different radius profiles if you wanted to use more than one, that way you can have different user bases. But, and let's go ahead and apply these changes here and set this up. We create OpenVPN server again, right? No, you can only create one. So even though you can create multiple WireGuard, and I know WireGuard doesn't have a traditional client server type of setup, but you can create more than one WireGuard instance, you're only allowed to create one OpenVPN server instance. Something else of note, if we go over here to our test OpenVPN and we can add users and manage them here, that's great. And it just manage them through the radius in the back end. And if we download the configuration file, and we look at the settings in here, you'll actually notice that it only has protocol TCP. I'm really not sure why they chose that. That is an odd choice to me. That is not the most efficient way to do OpenVPN. You can Google and head over to OpenVPN's documentation and read why to get more in depth, but UDP is a more efficient way to do this. Now, even in the manual settings, I don't see any way to fix that problem either. So I thought this was kind of an odd choice that they forced this. Even when you're choosing the port, it doesn't give you an option whether you want TCP or UDP. If someone knows why they did that, leave that in the comments down below. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, if we go to a switch and we go to the ports and we pull up the port manager, which I think looks great, except this is where the confusion comes in. There's no more all option on the network. We have the primary network of dot three 
than cameras, CG NAT, and other networks I can choose, or none, but there's not a all like it was before to essentially call this a trunk port. Now, when I choose dot three as a native, it actually will send all of these other because dot three is what we call our default. Then we have this new option called traffic restrictions. What this allows you to do is select to block all or the block these specific networks. Like maybe I want these networks not to go across here. So we're going to allow dot three and any network that doesn't match these names, or we can go over here to allow and we can say allow all these networks, or we can, you know, scroll through here and you're kind of seeing one of the problems I have with it from a UI design is I have a lot of networks. And if you are someone who has a lot of, well, a lab subnet, for example, with all these options, this is just a tedious way to do it. And yes, I can do things like this, but you can see from a UI element, I don't well, why they did it this way. They could have just expanded this and made it a lot easier, maybe a larger pop-out window. Uh, I hope the UX designers grab on this and go, hey, I guess we could probably do a better job on that. But I think they made this a lot more confusing when they did it this way because there's so many tutorials out there that have the all in it. The documentation says this too. in all these, not just my videos, but many people who've done these videos and now they've kind of thrown that out for reasons I can't completely understand. I guess it's to make a more granular control option here for restricting certain networks that go across and are essentially grouped together or trunked over to another network. So um, really kind of an odd design, but I'll do an updated video that kind of covers how to set up networks on Unify and make this maybe a little bit more clear. But nonetheless, I'm not exactly sure why they made that change. Once again, if you have thoughts on a good reasoning for this, leave them in the comments down below. Now, two more features I want to comment on, but I didn't really have time to test, but Cody from MacTownCom Networks, you probably watch his videos as well if you're looking up Unify things, he did show this. It's the ability to take a device that's assigned to a specific SSID and assign it to a different network. I thought this was kind of a neat feature. I just didn't have time to set up my lab with my UDM Pro and a Wi-Fi on it, and we don't deploy this commercially to any customers that we support on contract. Therefore, I didn't have any real testing to do with this, but it looks like a pretty interesting feature. Same goes for the hotspot. Now, one thing I will admit, and I've talked about this before, as new data becomes available, I'm always going to change my mind and new data, or I should say new updates have become available for the Unified Dream Machine series. So yes, I am, of course, changing my mind from the previous videos that are now still getting comments from a while ago, of, should you buy a Unified Dream Machine and offering my insights on that or what I I thought the shortcomings were as those shortcomings have been fixed, such as adding an open VPN server and WireGuard support. And hopefully soon they'll have the ability to do site to site with WireGuard. Right now it's only IPsec and open VPN, but I feel the rest of that's probably on the roadmap to bring it back to being what I would consider a normal basis for firewalls. This is common features in many other firewalls. I don't know why Unify took a long time to come around to this, but hey, they did. So here we are. And I'm going to be excited to do an updated review on that. And of course, I'll also do an updated review like comparison, if you will, between PFSense and Unified Dream Machine, because I know in the lab and home lab environment, it's a really popular choice people have between the two of them, and they want to know what the differences are. Therefore, I want to make sure I cover those very concisely. Leave your questions down below for that upcoming video to make sure I get as many of them answered, because my goal is ultimately to make it easy for you to understand and make those choices informed based on my experience with them. Now, we do do a lot of consulting when it comes to these Unify systems. If you want to hire us for consulting, head over to website, lawrencesystems.com. Click that hire us button at the top. We've helped many people set up the Unified Dream Machine and related devices. So my team is really familiar with them. We just don't have any that are under contract support that I can just log into and take a look at all the time is why I mentioned I didn't really have as much testing on there. Nonetheless, love hearing from you. Head over to my forums for more in-depth discussion. Reach out to me on all the different socials. Like and subscribe because it really helps out the channel. And thank you.